Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so the name of the title, um, well, let's say the title of the talk is a bit different from the one you got from the agenda. The only reason why um, is actually didn't fit in the screen. I'm really bad at writing titles and everything, so this is why. But we're going to speak about bug bounty inside big organizations and methodology that you can use to actually skill up your blue teams. So yeah, my name is Paul. How do you feel, guys? After three days of conferences and like so many talks, uh, when I saw the schedule, I was like, okay, I'm going to be the last one. That's going to be tough. Everyone's going to be sleeping. Uh, but yeah, I hope you're doing okay. Just a quick disclaimer. Um, this talk is not affiliated with my current employer. So all the views I'm giving is only my own and personal and blah, blah, blah and everything. I'm not going to say the same words as Ange during his uh, keynote, but yeah, you got the point. Just a quick uh, shameless um, advertisement. Did you hear about this website? Can you just like raise the hand if you, if you know it? A couple of people, cool. Okay, so uh, this is one of my latest projects I've been working on. So this is called CFP Time. And the project is actually to index call for papers around the world uh, for like your security conference. So let's say you've got a call for paper, which is currently open. Feel free, you can just like submit it on the website. And afterwards, I'm just going to review it. And everyone, let's say all the speakers in the globe uh, are going to be able to just like check which call for paper is currently available. So they're just going to be able to submit to it. Uh, the reason, there they were actually two reasons why I did this website. Just uh, uh, it, it's out of context, and afterwards I'm just going to go back to the talk. First one was because I wanted to give back to the community. And the second one was because we were getting an intern at the company, and his subject was about Django. I didn't know Django, so I was like, okay, what the hell? I'm just going to develop something. So I'm, I'm going to know about it. So this is why this is written in Django. Whatever. All right. Maybe you listened uh, to my French accent. So I come from um, Clermont-Ferrand, proudly come from there. Um, and this is uh, Le Puy de Dôme, which is actually um, a dead volcano. Uh, and this is next to yeah, Clermont-Ferrand. It's beautiful, especially if you like hiking, paragliding, and the hot balloon. Uh, yeah, this is beautiful. Feel free to come. Even French people sometimes don't really know exactly where this is. So um, I just checked from Luxembourg. It's, it could tell you, I mean, it, um, it should take 113 hours by walking if you want to come here. So, you know, just after the talk, feel free and just leave. Uh, and this is between uh, Lyon and Bordeaux in the middle of volcanoes. That's it. Anyway. Before this, um, so before coming back to France, I was um, living in London. This is why I kind of have this uh, really weird accent. Some people just ask me if I'm Australian, but no, no, I'm French. Um, and I used to live there, um, and I worked, and I was doing a lot of offensive stuff. So I was working for a, a company there. Are there some people here doing offensive? Just raise your hand. Like, literally, okay. Okay, okay. Few people here are doing offensive. So yeah, I was there doing penetration testing, red teaming, research and development, um, training, and doing all this kind of stuff. And once, so I went to, to a client to do an internal assessment. So I just like, you know, plugging in onto the network and trying to see what I could do. Turns out that after a couple of days, I owned the entire network, which was uh, quite fine. Funny fact with this was around uh, Christmas, so um, they hired someone from, I don't know, with a traditional Christmas dress, and she was giving us biscuits, and afterwards we, we had to take like a, um, how can I say, it's like a corporate picture. So they want me, you know, they wanted me on the, po on the picture with like everyone from the company, they were like, yeah, yeah, you're a newcomer, but yeah, feel free, you know, just come with us, there's the big boss here, you know, just come in on the professional picture. Anyway, I didn't. Um, and the reason why I'm stating this special event is after some time, so I just realized that, uh, yeah, I own the network and I actually owned it by a Buffalo Terra station, which was, which was on, uh, on the network. And I was, uh, so I went to, to see the guy from IT and I was like, okay, do you know that you have like this kind of network, this kind of device on the, on the network connected to it, which is vulnerable? Um, and I managed to get the slash etc shadow. I cracked the password, and there was actually backups from the DC. So yeah, game over for those guys. And then when I asked it to the IT guy, he was like, well, actually, I didn't remember we have this. 
And this is weird, isn't it? You're like, you're on, a, on the network of someone, and just after a couple of days, you realize that you actually know the network better than the guys who have been administering it for like a couple of months, a couple of years. And I will quote uh, someone I really think is um, extremely inspiring, Arun Mir. He did a keynote at T2 that was in 2016. And he was stating that one of the advantage of defensive team was actually if attackers get to choose what time we're going to engage with them, we get to choose the battlefield. So by looking at this, this is uh, La Bataille de Marengo. Well, um, if we actually take the parallel with um, attacks that we had like uh, in the early ages, before everything got uh, uber cyber, and if you knew the battlefield, you had such a great advantage. And something struck me there was that I was on the network of someone for just a couple of days, and I knew it definitely better than those guys who had been spending years and years and years in the company. And I was like, how is this actually possible? So if the cost to attack is less than the value of your information to the attacker, you will be attacked. And what I will show you later on are some kind of tricks that you can reuse inside of your company with recent events, because as you may know, the month of September was full of breach. Uh, and I will yeah, just show you with the, with the events. And I'm going to show you actually how you can, let's say, give more value. Um, let's say that, that the cost to attack your company is going to be actually higher than the, than the actual position right now. So I'm speaking about bug bounty. And the thing which is interesting with bug bounty is the community which is around it. So I guess if you're following HackerOne or Bug Crowd or a couple of hunters, you might see that like they have those hashtags together, we hit harder. And the community is really interesting in this way because they usually help out each other uh, to find new bugs. And sometimes they're just stuck and they're like, okay, can, can I just ask some advice to someone? And usually the guy, if he has the spare time, is going to try to help out with this. Um, and I think this is actually extremely good concept to have. And I will f continue this with my last quote. I'm sorry for this. Too many quotes. Kill the quotes. Build your defenses from an offensive mindset. Arun, during his keynote, was actually comparing, let's say, the home directory from one guy doing pen tests and one guy doing just, you know, blue team stuff. And he was really stuck, struck with the, the, the fact that when you're doing pen testing and you're just like looking at your home directory, you have tons and tons of, you know, just a small script that you created for just a specific need. You know, let's say those hacky scripts that are extremely helpful when you're doing an, an engagement. And on the other side, you have those guys doing blue team work and they just like buy those shiny new devices to protect the network, but they're not really embracing the hackiness, let's say. And I think this is going to be the motto for the rest of the talk. Um, so one guy I really do appreciate is the fact that um, he was stating the fact that enumeration is an ancient art. This is something that we know for um, ages, and this is something which actually came up again with bug bounty. Uh, and I will show you just a, a quick example. So there's this guy doing a lot of uh, bug hunting, and he actually got $900 finding an XSS in Yahoo. Okay, uh, we're not re really going to discuss the price, but this is mostly the methodology that he used for this. So first of all, he found um, yeah a domain, which which is quite weird, honestly speaking. When he got this domain, he actually found that there was yeah, a web server on the port 80. He started enumerating the files, so he got the about PHP and JinxConf, because reasons. Um, another file, testdb.php. And this file was actually vulnerable to a excesses, cross scripting, and he got the bounty and everything. But enumeration in this case actually helped him uh, finding new targets um, where he actually found other vulnerabilities. And those are the ones that he stated in his article. 
So when we're speaking about this, like if we take, uh, and I will take my case with big companies, you usually need to know your perimeter and you know what's accessible, what's exposed on the internet. You should basically have like, you know, let's say the, um, all the domains which are registered within your company. So you should be able to do all this stuff and you should be one step forward. Um, and this is actually where I want to come. So here, what should we do? Well, enumerate all the things. So first, we're going to try with, with the IP ranges and exposure. So you got some websites. Here we got the pgp.he.net that you might know, where you just put uh, the name of a company. So here, just put Uber. And here, you're going to get different kind of stuff. AS, obviously. And afterwards, you're going to get IP ranges. IPv4, IPv6. So inside your company, what you could do is just, first of all, take like all those ranges and put them in some kind of monitoring system to just know what kind of um, services are behind them. So I just took the example. By the way, I have nothing against Uber. I just took it as an example um, because a lot of bug hunters are actually chasing bugs with those guys. Um, and I think this is a good company. Um, so for example, here, I just, I just took the first IP range I just put it in showdown, and I see that here I actually have on this subnet slash 24, I have three servers which are actually um, running the, some NTP exposed on the internet. I just hope that this is well configured from those guys. So what? What should we do here? Well, first of all, when you get those IP ranges, what should you, what should you do? Just check if they are live and exposed to the internet, and wonder yourself, like, what's open on it, okay? Is it like HTTP server, NTP, and all this kind of stuff? Because you need to get this inventory up to date. The attacker is gonna wait and wait and wait until the moment where you're gonna put, the, let's say, just a Tomcat with default credentials, pawn it, and afterwards try to uh, tunnel into inside your network. So first was the IP addresses. Afterwards, as soon as you actually did the initial assessment, is actually checking if there's any delta between, let's say, if you're doing some kind of weekly check, next week, you're just gonna come up, do the same check, and see if there's any kind of difference. Okay, are there some ports which are not open, some, some, some new ports, some closed ones? The, what about the services? Did they change? Did it, did it come from, let's say, Apache to Nginx and so on? And one of the other points is like go for the low hanging fruits. Because especially in big organizations, you will have some. So let's say searching product Tomcat, and then afterwards maybe trying default credentials, port 445, especially in those days where you just like, we got WannaCry and not Petya and everything, port 3389 for the RDP, or otherwise you can just go for like port 21 and just checking for like anonymous access. And always ask you the question, those services, should it be exposed or not? Uh, so for example here, well, what I'm saying is obviously for some of you is like stating the obvious, but if we took the example of like recent hacks that happened, and we got, let's say, the community started chasing on Shodan, for example, and fighting for Deloitte, finding like a lot of RDP servers without MFA on this. This is like, okay. Uh, this is why I think that you need to take control of like your perimeter first, so you can just like rise up. So the second one is domain names, and especially for big companies, usually you have this kind of process where as soon as you're gonna have like a new service or let's say a new feature or a, um, yeah, let's say a new service that you're gonna put online, uh, you usually have a process where uh, you're gonna have the legal department which is gonna buy the domain and you know getting all this kind of stuff. But as soon as you have like subsidiaries. And if you need to like, I don't know, let's say you have a subsidiary in Asia and those people are not aware of like, let's say the whole process, they're just gonna bypass it and go with like another registrar and register another domain name. So what you could do here is like start ch chasing this. So if we, if we try to check the methodology for bug hunting, you have tons and tons and tons of tools. So DRVester is, I guess, one of the most famous, KnockP, Enumol, GoBuster, and so on. Um, there's actually a really interesting list from Jadix, uh, which is one guy from Bug Crowd. And this list is a list of um, subdomains that you can use for, let's say, DNS brute forcing. And it counts more than a million records in this. It did something really interesting. It took five of them, 
and he actually did a benchmark out of it. The two results with the red arrows are the ones which are like the most interesting ones. Go Buster, and you have mass DNS. You have the time to run, the number of threads, if it's defined, and afterwards the number of DNS, the domain names that he found. 87 for GoBuster, 213 for mass DNS. This can give you some kind of benchmark. So then afterwards you could like just use those tools to speed up the process inside your organizations. As soon as you have domain names, what could you do? You know, uh, because let's say if you have if you identify the four thousand domain names, what are you going to do? Are you just going to try to open them um, in the browser and see what's behind this? Well, there are actually some tools that you can use to take some screenshots out of it and just like display everything uh, in some reports. One of them is called Eyewitness. This is a pretty cool tool, and I think this is from Chris Drenser. And the tool, um, so it works either in a Docker container, or you can actually just run it, uh, let's say, inside your Kali. You give it a list, a um, few arguments if you want to take some screenshots from VNC, RDP, HTTP, HTTPS, and so on. And afterwards, this is going to be like one of the reports. Um, it's going to do some categorization out of it. So here, for example, in the table of contents, we have, okay, directory listing. Um, this is based on the output or on the response that he got from the domain names. He's going to categorize it as directory listing and categorized if he couldn't manage to categorize somewhere else. 401, 403 for unauthorized, 404, splash pages, and so on. Um, in the version I used, uh, I actually had... Um, highly interesting or something like this. And we actually identified default pages, default Tomcat pages, which were exposed on the internet, obviously not with default credentials, but this is something, let's say, that you could just like take care. Yeah, for example, this is one of the results you can have. On the left, you will get the web request information. So the first one is here, yeah, the URL, which is um, the URL here, then you're going to have the title, content length, and all the HTTP headers, and you will get some other information, let's say response code, and so on. And on the right, you will get the screenshot. So let's say instead of just like going one by one on these 4,000 domain names, here you just have like one report in a HTML file, you can just go through, and this is going to speed up your process a lot. This is on GitHub, feel free, just use it. And there, there's something here where I think this was really interesting, but I had to, for example, see what kind of technologies was behind this website. Because sometimes you need to know, let's say, okay, is there a Drupal which is running on this? Is there a WordPress? Can I have the version? And so on. So what I did here is I automated the process and using Wapalizer. So I guess you know this. There's a Chrome Firefox extension that you can just install. So I went on the Hacklu, Hacklu website. And this is going to tell you different kind of stuff. Let's say JavaScript framework. So Hacklu apparently is using Modernizer 2.7.1, jQuery 1.9.1, and different kind of other stuff like font script. Web server is going to be Apache. And this is based either on the DOM or on the uh, end, the HTTP, um, HTTP headers, which are retrieved from the HTTP request. What I did here, I did some automation. Because there's a yeah, Docker container, so what I did, I just took my list of 4,000 domains, and I just used Docker container to just call it, get some JSON outputs, and work out of it. There's also different kind of tools like X-Ray. Maybe you heard about it. This is from uh, Simone, uh, Italian guy who has been working on BetterCap and a few other tools. And this one, you just give it uh, one domain. This is going to do DNS brute force on its own. And as soon as it's going to get a new domain, it's going to resolve the IP address and get the result out of Shodan. It's going to display you everything in like a nice little table, and you're going to be able to export it as JSON or whatever. SSL certificates. This is, this is a bug bounty. Um, blog post, which was out on the 13th of October. So maybe you, you came across this one. And actually, one bug hunter managed to like, gain access to the internal chat system of Uber. And how he did this, he actually looked on the website crt.sh. And I think this is run by Komodo. Um, and from this, he actually got the um, domain name 
uchat.uberinterno.com. So for example, here I just launched a request for uber.com. And funny fact, I got um, <laughs> I got the domain name Simon Gruseki as hacked prod two dot uber dot com <laughs> obsec fail I mean come on um, what I did here for example is just a Python automation uh, this is just gonna send a HTTP request to CRT sh you just give it the um, the domain that you're looking for and then you're gonna get all the data in JSON so basically it's gonna be the domain name or the subdomain when this has been locked um, CRT sh ID if you need it um, the last time it has been seen and the issuer. And afterwards, maybe you can just like this with this kind of stuff. This has been open sourced, so feel free, just use it. Another website is called Census. So here I just took the request um, out of some blog post I found, uh, which I reference later. Uh, and here, what it's gonna do is just like, look in the port 443, check the certificate and get you everything where the name is uber.com. You're gonna get a bunch of results, 700, 83, uh, and you're going to get the different pages. So same stuff. I automated it in Python. Uh, you just like give it the query, pipe it in like just like let's say JSON file, and afterwards you're going to be able to just work out of it. So here, for example, I was just checking like the different ports which were open. Census um, are mostly checking for like web ports. So 80, 443, 80, 80, and 8,000, I guess couple of ports like this. I think the 25 is also checked. So feel free. Since this IO, I just open sourced it this afternoon. All right. Sensitive source code. Um, and we came up across this like a couple of times. Um, obviously, uh, you know, when, when you're speaking to developers, they might just like, by inadvertence, just putting some stuff online, um, and they actually didn't see it. Uh, and the thing is why, especially in big companies, when you work with contractors, you might do some kind of like awareness program and be like, okay, guys, just be careful with what you're going to post online because attackers might just check it. Um, you do this, you come back six months later, and because of the, of the turnover, you don't remember anyone. And you're like, okay, the guys who left, did they give you like the good practices? And they're just like, bah, no. No, 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 we didn't really have time to, to, to think about this. So I was like, what could we do to just like automate some kind of process to check if there's any kind of leak uh, going on those platforms, such as GitHub, Bitbucket, and everything? And wh what you could look for, so this is based still on a hacker one, just like check your company. Company and start looking for different kind of stuff. API, API key, secret key, AWS, password. You might just like not believe it when you're going to see it because I guess you might have some matches. Well, this was one of the biggest, well, let's say, drama of September uh, with Deloitte. Um, I was checking the program, and I saw that Deloitte was a, a sponsor for Hackloo, so I'm not going to say too much about this. Um, but some people actually chasing information on the internet and on Twitter and everything started looking for data and credentials on GitHub. Um, they found some, some which apparently were working. Uh, and one guy was like, yeah, well, what the fuck? I entered the Deloitte internet network. I would say that this is stupid to do this. This is legal to search the data, to look for credentials, but connecting to like, well, something which doesn't belong to you is completely illegal. So don't do this. Um, yes, some of the people just were like, okay, we should add GitHub to our threat model, definitely. Uh, and I really like this, uh, this comment. While people were just like poking at Deloitte on Shodan and finding RDP open and exposed on the internet and finding all the creds which were on GitHub, just like look at your organization, honestly. Go back on Monday and just like speak with your manager, go with this kind of stuff. This is super easy. This doesn't really need any kind of technical skills or anything. It's just like checking in the browser, not even using Google, but just like this is, this is just a yeah, simple search that you can do and you're going to just like make them freak out. Because when we were speaking about this before, um, hacking a company, so this is the, this balance of cost. You know, here basically the cost to actually enter the internet network of Deloitte is, is super low, because you just find the creds on GitHub and then you just connect, click, login, 
user, I mean, username, password, okay, boom, I'm logged in. This is super simple. So wh what I had in mind was actually automated tools that you could use uh, and integrate them in your UCI. So there are a lot of, lot of projects which are interesting, Git, Rob, Git All Secrets, Truffle Hog, and I would just like emphasize on the Truffle Hog. This is a really interesting tool. This is going to go through your Git repository, go through all the branches and all the commits. It's going to find high entropy strings. So for example, AWS tokens, AWS keys, Twitter uh, keys, or st stuff like this. Uh, this is going to be high entropy, and then it's just going to flag it. Uh, and I created I created a tool which is similar to Truffle Hog, and I'm going to show you like in just a couple of minutes. And this is doing basically the same, but instead of looking for high entropy strings, I'm looking for uh, some kind of pattern. So let's say just checking if in a commit someone used the word password, or if he started using some kind of host names, uh, which is let's say internal. And this is this is called Pepito. Uh, <laughs> Maybe, maybe I don't know if you know about Pepito. Uh, this, uh, this, um, this is. <laughs> I used to eat Pepito when I was a, when I was a child. Um, yeah, well, I developed this when it was like Saturday evening. Uh, I think I was a bit hungry, and yeah. Anyway, I was just like looking for a name. Ah, okay, I'm hungry. I'm just gonna call this Pepito. Um, here, so yeah, you just launch it in Python. You give it like a repository. So th this is one of mine, and you just like put it uh, dash dash search with the term that you're looking for. So for example, here, just a repository, I'm searching for password, and this is going to give me basically all the commits where um, the word password has been committed. OK, so let me just show you something which is, uh, which is fun. I checked with, uh, OK, here we go. So I'm just launching Pepito. And I'm going to run this on the AI framework from Circle. Can you see it? Yep, perfect. OK. And here, this is going to go through all the branches, all the commits, and it's going to highlight um, basically what I was looking for, the line where there was the term that I was looking for. So the term was the .circle.lu. And if I just go back, I'm going to see all the strings with, let's say, crf.circle.lu uh, with the port, which is completely public, right? This is fine. But I actually did the same on MISP. So I guess you all know about MISP. I got a fight called LULS. Um, what they did with MISP, I was looking for the, for the occurrence of a password. And after checking the results during the afternoon, I found some like interesting string which actually looked like password. Um, and I looked for this string um, in the files. The string was this one. So basically, just going up a bit, and you're going to get this stuff. So this is a commit from 2012 which has been done on the branch 2.4. The commit was migration to cake PHP 2.1, right? Q&A review required, I bet. And here you get a bunch of information. So you get like the, the mail address. And I freaked out when I saw the mail.be. Um, you get the GNU PG password. You get the home directory of the developer. Um, so yeah, I saw this this morning, and then I was like, okay, should I show this to you know to the audience and stuff like this? But this is basically the, the kind of stuff that you can find. And this was, and this is actually at the moment in the MISP um, current repository. So I was like, what the fuck? But, you know, nope. Okay. OK. The last point is going to be about the Amazon Web Services. Uh, by the way, how much time do I have? Is it fine or? Yep. OK. Thank you. I guess you heard about this. Uh, the Accenture leaked. Uh, and they actually had like four 
uh, 40,000 plain text passwords inside S3 buckets, which is massive. Uh, another title, uh, another blog post was about, oh yeah, as soon as they got this, um, they are the, how, do you, how did they say this? The, the keys of the kingdom. <laughs> I was like, yeah, obviously, this is crazy. There's um, a challenge online, which is called Flows, flows.cloud. And this is just a challenge that you can that you can that you can do online, which is which is free, and which is going to tell you about misconfiguration about S3 uh, buckets that you can have online. And I think that like everyone should do this, especially if you're using AWS and S3 buckets. Um, I created a script a while ago, so yeah, that was like five months ago, and this is something which is actually uh, doing what you do during the challenge, but fully automated. So what you could do is just like take the list of the S3 buckets you have and just like run it through. So then it's just going to tell you, okay, you should maybe check this one, check the configuration of this one, and so on, right? So I'm just going to wrap up quickly. A few takeovers, and I think this is some stuff that you could use right now. So Pepito, obviously. So I released the tool uh, today, so this is uh, fully public. Uh, a wrapper for census.io, which is also fully public. AWS scan script that you can use to try the, the security of your S3 bucket. Python script to actually grab uh, public reports and scopes from HackerOne. Because I think this is good to actually, you know, get all this data, public reports that you can get online, actually go through them with your team to just like check maybe if this kind of stuff, if maybe you have it in your, inside your organization. So I think this is cool stuff. Um, and then basically if you run the script, you're going to get the CSV afterwards, basically with like all the findings and public reports it has. Eyewitness, as I told you, which allows you to do some kind of a footprint by just like specifying a list of domains. Um, and it's going to give you like screenshots, bunch of headers, bunch of stuff, do categorization about it. And the last one is Wapalizer Docker Container. Uh, how to keep up? Um, well, first of all, I think that like two guys in the industry and let's say in the bug bounty uh, scene are extremely awesome, Jadix and Nahamsek. Those two guys are really helpful and giving like a lot of resources for free, which is great. And afterwards, many hunters, I'm not going to name a few here because otherwise I guess they, they would be upset like, okay, you didn't name it in the talk. So I'm just, you know, feel free, I'm just like go to see those two guys and then afterwards by doing a bit of book bounty, you're going you're gonna to get some, some good in information about who to follow and everything. This closed one, uh, H1 which is actually a Twitter account where as soon as you get like a pub, uh, report which is going public, then there's just like this Twitter account which is going to tweet about it. Or NetSec, because all the, all the articles I gave you during this presentation were coming from Reddit. And the last point is like develop stuff. Uh, why I would say this is like at the beginning of the talk, I was like embrace hackiness. And I think that blue teams actually need some people to start developing. Even if you think that this is shitty, Think about it, just like keep developing, because the thing is just buying appliances um, is not a proper way to do security. Here, for example, to actually delimit the perimeter that you have to understand what kind of technologies is running around. Uh, let's say if on Monday I just come up to you and I'm like, okay, there's a new zero day on Drupal. How many websites are impacted on your side? Maybe you would be like, mm, I don't know. So maybe just like think about the process and I think this is this is quite cool. The, um, the last point is just going credits to the people um, I quoted before, such as Arun Mir, for example. And I do think that we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We have some amazing people doing amazing stuff for the community. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say thank you very much for like all the ideas and the stuff they brought. So yeah. Thank you very much and uh, yeah, thanks for making it for the last talk. Okay, thanks a lot, Paul. <laughs>